and welcome everybody to Drunk Dudes in a Gun Room. Today, as usual, this show is brought to you by Operation Encore, my favorite 501c. They are a nonprofit that is currently helping veterans become rock stars. One of the things that we do. So if you don't mind, go over there to my friends Operation Encore at operationencore.org. Click that little donate button or follow their social media and learn all about what they're doing to help our veterans. Hey, today I have got a guest for you. Somebody that is an expert in a topic that I have been thinking about and and exploring and know nothing about it even after doing that. So <laughs> hope to learn a few things. Today we've got Jonathan Green. Jonathan Green is the best-selling author of 300 plus books, a celebrity ghostwriter, and a high-ticket affiliate marketer who now lives on a tropical island in the South Pacific. He has turned being fired during a blizzard into a thriving online business. Let's bring on Jonathan Green. How's it going, man? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Man, I am doing great. Hey, so why don't uh, you give everybody a little quick background of uh, where you came back? And, and I, I can't wait to hear about the uh the phrase being turned being fired during a blizzard and thriving in an online business so we'll dive into it awesome yeah i mean it all started when i just realized that my career wasn't where i wanted it to go you know you think something's going to be your dream job or you think it's going to be a job for the rest of your life you know you start get that job with all the benefits. It's like all the health insurance, the life insurance, and they're going to help you write your will and all that stuff. And then you realize you hate it. And I hated my job. So when they fired me, I said, I'm not going to look for another job like this. I'm done. I want to find something else. I want to be in control of what I do. Oh, I, I get that. Absolutely. You know, so I actually, when I got out of the military, I opened up my own company and, uh, it was more so to, cause I couldn't find a job. Everything in the area had closed down. And, uh, I thought that's what I wanted to do. I really did. And, uh, I learned real quick that the trucking industry was not for me. You know, I opened up a trucking company. I was in a truck six weeks at a time by myself and nothing but headaches. And I learned real quick that everybody that you associate with makes money, but you, <laughs> Oh, everything's very expensive. Yeah, it's sometimes it's really hard to know from the outside who's the one making money in different industries. And can, it can often be you often hear, oh, truck drivers make the most money. But yeah. And yeah. then like, oh, but only if you own your truck. But then you have to pay for your own repairs and you have to do this and that. So there's a lot of moving parts. It's not always what people yeah. say that it is. It's the people that own the freight. That's who makes the money. So how did uh how did you come into AI? You know what? Um about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I just saw everyone talking about AI and all these tools. I've been using it for a couple of years, but it had never been good enough for prime time. And mm -hmm. I finally saw that there was content coming out from AI. I was like, oh, this is okay. Like this is readable, it doesn't sound terrible. Maybe AI's finally crossed the bridge from interesting to useful. And when I saw that, I just started diving in. I saw all of these trainings and training videos where people say, AI can do this, but it can't do that. And I kept thinking, oh, I bet it can do that. I bet it can go further than you think. And I realized that everyone would, one person would make a video and everyone would copy it. And they would all kind of give it the same limitations. So when I started to play around and go, I'm just going to assume that it could do everything I want it to. A lot of the things people said, it can't do this. It could do it for me. So I realized I just had this natural affinity. So I just began to dive deeper and deeper. And as I got better and better, people would ask me, how are you doing that? How are you doing this? And I started to realize that like I'd pushed ahead of everyone else in my industry. Yeah. You know, I had, I known about AI as well. I have listened to a lot of different arguments about it on, uh, the uh the internet uh some people think it's the devil some people think that it's going to be the next amazing thing and uh i have just recently started using it um basically more so to help me with my 501c um i love learning new stuff so sometimes i'll just get on chat gpt and just type in stuff just to to learn you know and and i don't know necessarily how accurate the information is or if it's just like a web crawler and pulls all the information in 
Can you give everybody a little bit of an idea of how AI actually works? Basically, they've taken as much information as they can get their hands on. So they've tried to copy the entire internet, which does include some stuff that you don't realize is on the internet. And they've mm -hmm. fed it all into that big old computer. So it has this massive database. And that means that anything on the internet, whether it's true or not, is kind of in there. So this is why when it pulls a piece of data, it doesn't weight the source. So if something's on a thousand websites and something's on a hundred websites, it'll assume the thousand websites is more accurate most of the time. So okay. this is why if you ask it to write you like a sales letter it will, or a commercial, it'll always write you something cheesy because most of the content out there is not good. Most websites are not good. Everyone built the website in the 1990s on like GeoCities and all those types of places. And all those were flashing lights and bad websites, all that stuff. So that's where it gets most of its data from. And that's, the big limitation. So if you don't kind of limit it and tell it, Oh, just use good sources, then it can pull a lot from there. And that's why you can end up with like strange stuff, but it has in the database, good and bad data. So you just have to start training it to not listen to the bad data and it can get some really amazing stuff, but that's how they trained it. When they retrain it, they're always giving it more and more data. This is why a lot of people are trying to sue them and say, Hey, chat GPT read my book, chat GPT read this and that. Don't let it use my content against me because they just like it's like this insatiable monster that they just feed as much content as it can because it just wants more, more, more. And so they're just constantly pouring everything, get their hands on into its mouth. Yeah, you know, I never even thought about that, but that does make sense. You know, you put something on the the network, say I wrote a, a blog and it did pull stuff from that, you know and then it gives other people stuff that i said i i wonder how that does work with like copyright and and stuff like that, that is kind of interesting yeah you can fight against it so it's actually read some of my stuff that it's not supposed to it's read my book at least one of my major books which are not supposed to be on the internet right but of course mm -hmm. someone out there probably stole my book broke yeah. the encoding put it on a website as a pdf and chat gpt found it so i can either get mad and sue like some authors are doing or i can just accept the genius out of the bottle and say how can i be the person who figures this out first because it's the right. same thing 30 years ago 25 years ago people were fighting against napster they're like i don't want my music on the internet right and yep. did they succeed no yeah. they they spent hundreds of millions of dollars billions of dollars suing and fighting and building technology and i know my family's in the music business so i know a lot of the things they tried between watermarking music and they would do a thing where every time every single person in the song had a different hidden code in it so they could see who'd uploaded it. Yep. I remember they used to sue people for uploading songs and I'm sure they ruined a couple of people's lives, but it didn't stop anyone. No. Every single movie, every single song, every single video game ends up online and within a week of release, right? Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how much you encode it. I think DVD, right? DVDs were like had a code. So you couldn't take the unfather. Someone broke it in like eight hours. Blu-ray yeah. took someone like 12 hours. So it's like, oh, for half a day, nobody can steal this. So people who are going to do that are going to, and that part doesn't matter, right? Just that the technology, once it gets out, enough people are going to go, okay, that someone will keep it going. And the same thing with ChatGPT, you can't unteach it, mm -hmm. that content, because it's right. out there and because people have figured out how to do it. So instead of trying to turn back the clock, you have to, especially myself as an author who's in there, you can say right in the style of Jonathan Green and it will sound exactly like me because that's how I found out it could do me. And I can fight against that or I can say, well, how can I be the first person to leverage this? How can I accept this is the future now, right? Robots are here. AI technology is here. Yep. I can't undo, but maybe I can use it in a way to make my life a little bit better. I, You know, I really do. Now that I've been playing with it, you know, I don't have the fear from some of these other podcasts that I've listened to about how, you know, the dangers that's out there. So if you go back to before the internet, um, I don't think anybody really thought about the dangers that the internet's going to provide. And even if you did, it's going to grow there. It, just like you said, there's no way you're going to prevent some of these things. So I'm sure with AI, there will be some bad, but I think, if you look at overall what the internet's done, it's done a lot of great stuff. 
Um, I mean, me and you're talking, you're in a, you know, a, a tropical island and I'm over here in Missouri freezing my butt off, but you know, look at how we're talking, no issues. And, uh, I think AI is going to do some amazing things. I mean, it's already helped me just with my podcast. It's helping me with some coding stuff that I'm trying with apps and stuff like that. And these are things that, you know, before I used YouTube for, and it would take me a lot longer to go through videos to find the video I really wanted to learn what I really wanted. And uh, then you still have to get through all the clickbait stuff to even get to that. And so I, I use ChatGPT for that type of stuff, which is probably the very, very basics of what anybody, you know, like yourself even uses it for. But it's helped me with some things like coding some, you know, OIS is a struggle for me. And it's helped me with that type of stuff. Um, I've I've used it a little bit for some legal stuff for my nonprofit. And that's about it. That's about to the extent of it. And that's the thing is everyone uses it in a different way. Yeah. So it's easy to think this tool is good or bad and it's about how people use it you know as soon as the internet came out what happened people started sending sketchy emails people started yep. scamming each other now people are using ai to scam each other so there's always going to be good and bad actors and there's always going to be like using ai to write spam emails using ai to block spam emails so it's always that perpetual yep. battle between the sword and the shield right it's like oh we make a good body armor then we have to make a better bullet then we make a better bullet then they make an even better body armor and it's that's the way it's been since the invention of like boiled leather armor right so mm -hmm. the you never going to escape that what you have to do and this is in a lot of areas people make the mistake they blame the tool which is neutral you can use a hammer for good or bad you just can't so you can't blame the hammer. The tool exists. You have to blame is the people and figure out why people do bad things with neutral tools. Yep. So in the same thing, we definitely have people that are using AI for bad stuff. They're putting out content. They're putting out emails. They're doing all sorts of stuff that's naughty. We have to figure out how can we make this one thing stop? Certainly, right? We certainly don't want people using it for bad, but the tool's already out there. And it's really about figuring out this new future a world in which this tool exists because you can't undo right like think about this it used to be like the thought of renting music was so anathema we don't go no i don't want to rent a cd i want to own a cd because i bought yeah. the music so i can listen to as much as i want now that's what everyone does right every single yeah. person is either renting music on spotify or apple music or tidal there's all these platforms that just rent music and we don't think of it as renting music anymore right we've changed yeah. our mindset even though when they first tried it early 2000s with the Zune, like they had this Microsoft Zune store where you could rent music and be like, I don't want that. And that's why that platform failed. But now it's like, that's what we're used to. So sometimes it takes a little while to shift in mindset, but now nobody owns music anymore. It's so rare to buy a physical piece of music. Everyone just uses digital stuff that they rent. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I never thought about Spotify as renting either, but you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is. <laughs> Same with, you know, all my movies now are online saved up in my Apple TV. And it's the same thing. Even though I paid and bought it, I still am technically renting. I don't have anything physical um, in my hands. So yeah, absolutely. So Operation Encore is a 501c nonprofit that is helping veterans turn into rock stars every single day. You can learn more about what Operation Encore is doing by going over to their website at www.operationencore.org. That is www.operationencore.org. If you can give them a hand, just click that little donate button or follow all of their social medias and learn exactly what they are doing to change the lives of our veterans every single day. Um, AI right now, and I know it's in its its baby phases of it, but where do you think it can help people the most right now? Say with ChatGPT, was it 4.5 that they're on or 4.0? They say they're on 4.0, but some people have found that they might secretly be on 4.5 or they're testing 4.5 in some of their platforms. That's The thing about a lot of these tools is that they're very 
secretive about their releases and their products. Oh, yeah. So no one really knows what they're getting. It's very strange. They'll add a new feature, but not tell anyone. So right now for most people, the best way to use the tool is to look at what do you do every week and where would there be the biggest opportunity? What's the task that you spend the most time on that's the most repetitive, that takes less than 100% of your attention? That's the best place to start. So it's really, when I say that, it's like, is there something you do every week that you could do with the television on? That's how you know it does take 100% of your attention. Like there's tasks I can do with the TV on, tasks I can do with music, and tasks I need everything off because it takes so much focus. So when you look and find that task, you say, okay, this is a task that if I could get this handled by AI, it would save me five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours a week. That's where you want to start is with that big win. Okay. So you get that massive change. And it could be answering emails. It can be organizing something. It can be an element of data entry, whatever that thing is. That's where you start because that's where you're going to move the needle. A lot of people go for the coolest thing. and like, oh, I learned this really cool thing. How much time does it save you? Four minutes a week. <laughs> it's not really right. It's the wrong place to start because it's exciting, but not useful. Right. Useful is really where you want to be. So where I started myself with was editing books. So when I wrote my recent book, Chat to be Profits, I was like, I don't, I opened up my editing software and I was like, this is going to take me a week to edit. And I said, what am I doing? It's just about to start. I go, what is wrong with me? And I sat down and said, there has to be a way to get chat GPT to edit the entire book to save me massive amounts of time without me losing the quality, right? Because the thing mm -hmm. about AI is that it doesn't make spelling mistakes, doesn't make grammatical mistakes, it doesn't make punctuation mistakes. So I can run my entire book through this to remove all of that type of mistake. So even if I just do the proofreading type of editing, it's a massive win that saves me a huge amount of time. Because normally when I edit, the software will point out every possible thing and I have mm -hmm. to check to it immediately because it's not always right. And it means that I still have to read the whole book and I have to check the whole thing and it's a huge amount of work. So instead, I edited the book using ChatGBT. It took me one day instead of five, so it saved me 80% of the time. And all I had to do was check the output. So now instead of reading it, changing it, reading it, changing it, reading it, the final version, I just read the final version of its output. And when something's off, I just start over and fix it. So not everything that came out was perfect, right? It, I right. still had to do a lot of fixing along the way, but it saved me so much time. I use the same process now for writing show notes for my podcast or doing research on a potential podcast guest. Show notes for my podcast used to take me one or two hours or I'd have to pay someone that equivalent to do it for me. Now, ChatGPT writes the show notes for me in about 30 seconds. It saves me time and money because it's a task I have to do every week, right? Every week when you put an episode, you have to write your show notes, you have to write your description, you have to write content for social media. Yep. So those are the places that's the best place to start, especially if you've been doing it for a while. So trying to teach it a task that you haven't done before means that you can't give it examples of the right way to do it, right? If I've never done show notes before, I say, write show notes for my episode, it's going to go random. Who knows yep. what database? Are. But if I say, here's my show notes from last week, write show notes for this week that look just like those. Now it has something to model. It's much more likely to have success. If you wanted to wow. write emails on your behalf, you can just upload a data file, like a Word doc, and say, here's every email I've written in the past year. This is what I sound like when I write emails. Here's an email I want you to reply to. Reply to this email. Now it can sound like you and do a really good job because it has a data source like that is the ideal, right? The ideal result has an example of what the final output should look like. And then it has the data that it's working from, which is today's email to reply to. When you give it those two things, right? Just like I give it this week's transcript of this week's episode and the show notes for last week's episode, giving it the, here's the raw data and here's the ideal outcome that I've created in the past. Now you can have it created. And because you've done it before, you can look at the show notes and go, hey, something's wrong here. You made a mistake. Because sometimes it gets it wrong, right? So it still isn't a perfect tool because it right. still does thinking. Just like when you have an employee, sometimes they'll get a visit from the good idea fairy. Yep. So I still have to check the output. And that's what you do. You don't want to fire yourself or quit your job or replace yourself. No, you're just pushing yourself into management. So the task now, the show notes are made. I still have to read them and check them. So I'm still doing what a manager or what a boss would do, which right. is check the work of the AI. And that's a lot less time, but it still has to be done. And when you do that, that's how you avoid putting out the content that's like got something weird in it or was obviously written by AI or all of that stuff. So and, and AI is still at this point still strictly text based, right? It's not like you're not able to like upload a, a video file and say, hey, write a blog about my last episode. Here it is. You know, it's still text based, right? So what it will do is use the transcript 
of that video. So it there is some visual elements like Chad he can see a single image, but it can't see video yet. That will happen eventually. It could happen oh, yeah. in the next week. Could happen in there's talk that it's a couple of weeks out. There's talk that it's six months out. So eventually that ability will come out. But as of right now, the way it works is even if it says it's watching a video, it's just reading the transcript. And often the transcript is made by another tool. So if I say watch this YouTube video, it will actually use the transcript that YouTube has generated. It doesn't even generate its own transcript because it's faster. Oh, so wow. that's what's actually happening when it says it's watching a video. You can upload a like a, a file directly and it will then transcribe it itself. It's just a lot slower, but that's what it's really working from is the transcript. Okay. Now, so I do use a website that, you know, and, and I'm sure AI has been a buzzword now, you know, now anybody that's selling a product throws that word in there somewhere, whether it's legitimate AI or not, sometimes it's hard to tell. So I use a website that does help me make reels and stuff from my, um, previous shows and stuff like that because that's one of those things that it takes me hours to do and it's also one of those things i absolutely hate doing because i'm not a fan of little short reels short videos i think they're they're bad for veterans that are already suffering from mental health because it takes your ability to think and your attention to 30 seconds versus actually thinking through problems and that's just strictly my opinion. But uh, so I do use it because it is a necessary evil. You still are going to have to do this with a podcast is is go to where the people are viewing and reels and shorts are there. So I do use a site that claims that they use AI for that, you know. Yeah, so what that tool is actually doing, I use one of those as well. They're so helpful. It's actually using a transcription because transcription software has been around for years. It's been getting better and better. So it, uses, it develops the transcript, and then from the transcript, it looks for, oh, these phrases look good, and then it will mark those time codes, and then okay. it shows it to the video. So it's two-stepping it, but it's still working from the transcript, which makes sense because yeah. the tools that are manual for creating show notes and clips, the ones that work the best are the same thing. They'll show you the text yep, and have you work from that. They'll go, oh, here's the beginning text. Here's the, here's the text. You can edit from text. Yesterday, I was working with this where I was editing – a video from a client of mine and it had me giving instructions and her then doing it, I was able to go through and just delete everything where I was talking by looking at the text every time it said my name. So that saved me so much time. Whereas if doing it manually by listening, the hardest way to edit video and audio is by listening because it means you have to do it in real time. And I speak much slower than I can read, right? We all do. So switching to this mode that's how i was able to edit and it was very very fast that process it's something that could have taken me an entire day took me less than an hour and that's really the difference with just using that type of editing so a lot of tools have added that ability in right where they show you the transcript and from the transcript they then edit the video okay yeah that makes that makes perfect sense. i never even thought about it doing that but yeah that does make perfect sense so Let's let's discuss a little bit about one how to navigate for for the guys that are like me they're still learning ChatGPT. Let's talk about a little bit about how to navigate with ChatGPT and then we can get into your thoughts of where you think the future will be and where you think it will go to. I think I mean I think we all know but I don't think anybody can really imagine um you know I really feel like this is one of those things where the sky's the limit, you know? The problem with chat GPT and you hit the nail on the head is that it can do so many things that it's overwhelming to go, oh, this tool can do this and that and this and that. So when a tool just does one thing and does it well, that's very easy to know what to learn, yeah. right? But with chat GPT, the onboarding is terrible. Their training is terrible. All of that information is really very limited, right? And the reason yeah. they did that was they were like, we want to see what people do. So we're not going to give you any guidance. So it's like, oh, every user is like a rat in a maze. And I was like, I don't yep. want to be a user. And that's my experience. But I know that's what they're doing. So yep. we're the product. <laughs> easiest thing. And that's why I always start with people. Instead of starting my teaching techniques, like the first thing I told you was like, figure out what task you want to do before you start thinking about techniques. What's the task that's useful for me? What's the opportunity? So once you know what task you want to do, you have to learn one prompt. 
Okay. I see people selling collections of a thousand prompts, a hundred thousand prompts, a million prompts, these complicated prompting guides. It's all just smoke and mirrors. It's all just to make it seem more valuable. Here's all you need to know. Chat GPT, I want to do X. What information do you need for me to accomplish this goal? That's how I start every conversation. I want to create show notes. What information do you need from me? I want to edit my book. What information do you need from me? Wow, I want to okay. I want to learn how to I locked myself out of my bathroom. I actually locked out of my bathroom right now. I want to learn how to get myself into the bathroom because I don't know where the key is. Chat GPT, what do we do? So sometimes you change the question a little bit, like mm -hmm. tell me how to do it. But or if you're trying to come to me and say, what information do you need for me? Or and it's really basically information plus question. I know what I want to accomplish. I know my goal. Here's my goal. And then by asking a question, you're switching chat GPTs into interactive inter, into interrogative mode, which means it's allowed to ask you questions, it's allowed to tell you something's wrong, and it's allowed to give you multi-part answers. Normally, Chat GPT lives one prompt at a time. It always thinks you will never ask a follow-up question. So it has to give you the best possible answer in a universe where you don't ask follow-up questions. Yeah. Because it's thinking that way, it's super limited and it will always give you the best answer it can. But when you're wrong, it won't tell you because it's not allowed to because you're never going to ask a follow-up question. So telling you, oh, you gave me the wrong data is a bad use because... Yeah it doesn't get you to where you need to get, right? It won't get you to your answer. So instead, it will just give you the best answer based on that. And it's with the assumption, you're never going to ask a follow-up question. But as soon as you say, if you need to give me multi-part answers, if we have to go back and forth, we can by asking a question. Now you've switched it and it now goes, oh, we're having a conversation. Instead of a one, 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 it's now a multi-part conversation. So now it will tell you if you've given it bad data. It will tell you the data that it needs. And it will bypass a lot of the mistakes that crush people. Like one of the first things I ran into was someone was saying, oh, and then you just put in, in the blank, my customer avatar. I was like, most people do not know their customer avatar. Like most people, that's like the hardest thing for you to tell them to do. So yeah. instead, if you, um, I said to chat GPT, chat GPT, I'm trying to figure out my customer avatar. What information you need from me? And it asked me seven to, it always asks seven to nine questions. You don't have to answer all of them. And if that's overwhelming, you then your next thing is just ask me one at a time. So you don't have to answer them all at once. Sometimes I say one at a time. Sometimes I answer them all at once. Just depends how hard the question is for me. Mm -hmm. And even though I teach customer avatar, I have a customer avatar worksheet I give away on my website. I've taught it in four or five different courses. I don't always remember all the questions off the top of my head. We all do that. That's why yeah. pilots have a checklist, right? The first thing yeah. a pilot does when they're getting the plane, they have a checklist. Not because they don't know how to turn the plane on. That's not why they have the checklist, right? They have the checklist because sometimes you forget a step, right? Or sometimes yeah. you... Way. And I'm a huge fan of checklists. The Checklist Manifesto is an amazing book that shows how just adding five to seven point checklists to tasks increases effectiveness like exponentially. It makes everything way, way better. Mm -hmm. So that's why having a, a checklist and ChatGPT always wears a checklist. It never forgets a question. So it asks me the question. I go, oh, I would have forgotten number eight. It wasn't on my, I forgot that one. So even as someone who's an expert, right, in avatar creation, I forgot a step because it's natural. So I answered the questions and it wrote me an unbelievably high quality description of my ideal customer. So it's able to do things effectively because it has a consistency that we don't have. So it will always ask you the right questions. So you don't then have to constantly remember, like I see this other approach to prompting, which is very formulaic. And I, I know that formula very well. Okay. I know how to write really complicated prompts. I have prompts that are 3000 characters long. I have prompts that are so long, I have to enter it in two parts. That's not what most people need to use, right? That's a 0.1% of user thing. So for me, the big value is the ability to do things in a simple way. And when I write my really complicated prompts, I start them all with the question anyways. That's how I really build everything. So if you approach it from that mindset of, here's what I need. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to learn any of that stuff. You don't have to learn complicated prompting forms. You don't have to do stuff that's scary. You can just learn this one thing. Yeah. And then even if they update chat GPT 4.5, a version of five, you don't have a bunch of prompts that have become obsolete. You have one simple method that's only becoming more effective. That's it's in the name. They want you to chat with it. So you just have to give it permission to chat. And then it becomes an amazing tool that requires no genius on your part. You don't have to be smart anymore. You don't have to be a prompting master. You don't have to, have to be an expert. You can just be a simple person that knows how to ask a question. 
You know, talking to you already, I realized I am that one and one guy. I tell it what I want and it gives me something. And then I evaluate on if I want to use that. And then if I didn't like it, I hit the re-ask button, you know, and it's because I didn't know any of this stuff that, that you were just talking about. So, I mean, you just, just in that conversation right there, you've already changed how I'm going to be using. And I never thought about it as using it as a conversation. And that's because that's how everyone uses it. Everyone uses it because that's how we're taught. We're, we're all taught from media most of us the way we interact with the world comes from television shows and movies and if you think about on star trek what do they say do 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 computer open the door do 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 computer teleport me here computer shoot the laser this person (laughs) they always treat the computer in the future right like on this massive spaceship they go world to world spaceship they can go nine times the speed of light they never treat it like it has any level of intelligence right they never treat it like an artificial intelligence they treat it like a 1990s windows 3.1 computer right they treat it like computer open this folder and it's really simple they never and so we're used to that right which is come oh when you're talking to a computer you give it a command so that's why we all speak that way because that's what we've all seen and that's why we all look up when we talk to a computer as well because we're so used to them doing it on those tv shows yeah it's the same a lot of people do this when they're hearing something because we've seen it Real Secret Service agents don't do that. Yeah, (laughs) That gets rid of the whole secret part, right? They do not do that. So we have these habits that only come from media and we don't realize that we're repeating something we saw on television or movie. But we, if we just move away from that and you go, I'm going to ask you a question. It's okay for you to give me, to tell me I asked it in the wrong way because that's how we act in normal life, right? In normal conversation. So you're just kind of, have to give it permission and it will just let you because sometimes you have to ask three or four questions to get to the right answer it allows you to break through all that challenge that's a problem for most people i I was just laughing because thinking back now about how i'm using chat gpt i just pictured how my 80 year old mom uses alexa you know she she talks to it like it's so foreign instead of just asking a question and here i am doing the same thing with the new technology of chat gpt i'm acting like my 80 year old mama with alexa (laughs) so that's why i was kind of laughing there for a minute it's how we're taught we're all taught the ai will obey right you give a command and the thing obeys nobody wants alexa to say you go alexa play the song Alexa goes are you sure it's not really a good band right (laughs) don't you have better taste in music like that's not what we want right we don't want pushback from our AIs. So that's why they're not, unless you give it permission, yeah. then it can do those things. So that's why we communicate in that way because most of the time we don't want pushback. But when we're working with ChatGPT, we're actually looking for the best answer, not the fastest answer. And unfortunately, I see this all the time is people say, oh, I can replace all of my content creation with AI. And if you look on your social media feed, you see so much content that you can tell. I can tell when an image is created by the ChatGPT image generator Dolly 3 because it looks, their default image style has a certain look to it that's kind of shiny. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, every image that's shiny, it's so obviously AI. And it's not because the AI can't create great images. It's because the person using it is lazy. It's the best way to say it. They're doing the laziest form of prompting. They're not changing the shape from a square. They're not changing the style to something else. They're not modifying it in any way. And because they're doing that, they're really, the problem is not the AI. It's not that, oh, AI makes bad content. And so AI in default mode all looks the same. Yep. Every time I see a social media post, it says, oh, you think it's really this problem, but actually it's that problem. I go, oh, that's AI always writes. Every post starts that way with a, it's not A, it's B. Always. Yep. It's f- favorite way to start. Just like if you see a post on social media, it starts with a question. You go, oh, this is an ad. Yep. So there are certain things that are giveaways that you don't even realize. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, man. I didn't even think about it until you just said that, but you are right. If, if it starts off with a question, it's definitely an ad. <laughs> that is true. And we, as a consumer, we don't notice it. Why? But we know, oh, this feels like an ad. And as the creator, they, they don't realize, oh, I'm because I think I'm running a commercial, I'm running a commercial, right? Yeah. And so it becomes obvious. So the secret is to really read the actual content and read it as a reader. I was writing something yesterday and it did that to me. I was writing 
forget what it was. I think I was responding, like writing a reply to something or a comment or posting something, like a small thing. I think it was a piece of text that was going to go with one of my social media clips. And I had ChatGPT write it. And I noticed that it put in a bunch of AI words. I said, oh, this is not good. I'll just write my own thing. So you have to just be aware of it. That's the first step is just to be aware that it's not that AI is obvious. It's just that the quantity makes it obvious. So if I see 50 posts on social media in a row, they're all written by the same person, I'm going to notice, right? Yeah. So if I read 50 Stephen King books and then I read one of his books under a different name, I'm still going to notice, oh, this is the same author. That's what's really happening is that it's a combination of laziness by the users and mostly because they don't know a better way to do it combined yeah. with quantity means I see so much. If I only saw one chat GBD post a day, I wouldn't notice. Right. But it's not one. It is not one. Yeah. No, you, you are, you are, I'm sure you are right. Cause I'm always late to the party. So I am sure there's a lot more people using it than, than we even know about. So let's talk a little bit about the average user, right? When you go to subscribe to chat GPT, like I noticed I've subscribed through my phone, but I don't have the same access on the computer as I do on my phone. And I don't know if that's because I did something wrong or whatever, but um, I can't use 4.5 on my computer, but I can use 4.5 on my phone. And so is there like, if you were to talk to the the basic guy that's just going to basically use it for his podcast or or his blog or something simple, he's not trying to create a big business. Is there different subscription methods that you need to do different things? Or is it basically just one size fits all based off of what you want to pay, whether it be annually or monthly or whatever? They only offer one subscription, which is $20 a month. Okay. So what they've actually done is, according to a lot of other companies, messed up the market. So what they did is put a massive downward pressure on pricing in the software market. So a lot of competitors who are charging you by the word or giving you word limits per month or all sorts of things and charging $150 a month, mm -hmm. because ChatGPT has done this and there's no limitation, they have forced everyone else to drop their prices. So a lot of competitors, in, a new competitor just went from free to paid and guess what they're charging? 20 bucks a month. Yeah. ChatGPT set this new standard that made AI affordable for everyone. So they have the free version, which anyone can use, which right now is at 3.5. It will probably switch to 4.0 soon. So what happens is when they release a new paid version, the old paid version eventually goes becomes free. Right. So the, what you're noticing is that they are testing. They do a lot of testing on their users. So they will give me a feature and not you for a couple of weeks, depending upon which group I'm in. So you and I are probably in two different usage groups. Right. So, and it doesn't always go that way, by the way. I've had where they I'm the last person to get access to something. So I was the last person, one of the last people to get access to Dolly 3, the image generator that's part of ChatGPT now. I was in the last group. So everyone else had it for like two weeks, and then I got it on the last day. Whereas when they released GPTs, which is the bots I can push to people, I got it before everyone else. In fact, I got it before a lot of the other people who create content like me and post on social media. They're like, oh, I don't have access yet. And I was like, I already have access in both of my accounts. So... What they do is test in batches, and they also have things that they test only on phones versus only on computers. So the only you can do voice to prompt only with your phone, okay. And you can do for a while you could only do um, visual stuff. So you could upload a picture, but only on your phone. So what they're doing is just testing in different cohorts, and they also test between different devices. So if you're logged in with the same email address on the computer and the phone you have the same accesses. However, they hide everything. So actually, to, you have to go in, click on your name, click on settings, click on beta settings, and then turn on a couple of things to activate things. Like that's how you activate wow. access the free plugin store. That's how you access free GPTs. You might have access to, and I've seen this happen where they've had access to it for six months and they didn't know because they didn't know. It's hidden. It's not one click away. Yeah. <laughs> it's like settings, personal settings, beta. Then you'll see stuff. And I have to check that. Every time I hear there's a new feature out, I have to check to make sure that I, all, I say, yes, give me all the beta features. And then when you actually start a conversation on the computer, it gives you three choices. You can choose um, ChatGPT, ChatGPT with no access to other tools, or ChatGPT with plug-in access. So you actually okay. have to start each conversation, know which. And they moved that. That used to be in the in the the um, at the top middle of the screen. Now it's at the top left of the screen. So they <laughs> once you figure out where it is, they go, we got to move it again. <laughs> We got to make it harder to find. So <laughs> to 
activate the plugin store, you have to go go through that beta process in your settings, say, yes, give me access to the plugin store. Then when you're prompting, you have to click on where and say, oh, I want to be in plugin mode. Then you have to click on that, scroll to the bottom, click on plugin store, and then you can see the plugins. And they've organized the plugins alphabetically. It's unsearchable. So there's no worse way to organize large groups of data than alphabetically, right? Yeah. Wow, they said we could organize this by category, by usefulness, by company that makes it, by what the tool does. Let's organize it alphabetically. Let's go for yellow pages, 1800s. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's use the sorting method that predates elect electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the decisions that they make at OpenAI, it's how you know you're working with a bunch of nerds. Yeah. A lot of the ways they give us data, a lot of the ways they let us do things are in the way that's the most the craziest way to do it, like the most inconvenient way. And that's just what we have to adapt to. Yeah. Have you ever wondered how you can help out the show? Well, that is very simple. You can help us out by going to www.2drunkdudesinagunroom.com. That is www.2drunkdudesinagunroom.com. There's many ways you can help us by listening to the show, supporting the show, liking, sharing, and everything else that comes along with social media. But one of our biggest goals is to help build the nonprofit Heroes Voice Media Foundation. This is a foundation that has decided to start celebrating courage and amplifying heroes. Find your voice with Heroes Voice Media Foundation. No, that, that, yeah, that does make sense. I'm just now sorry that I've been paying for ChatGPT and I didn't know there was plugins. So <laughs> I've probably got access to a lot of stuff that I, I'm going to have to go back and, and relearn. So well, let's talk a little bit real quick before we get into futuristic stuff. Um, the, uh, is there competitors for ChatGPT? I mean, if anybody worthwhile, I'm yeah. sure there's, there's some out there, but. There's a couple of good ones. So Claude is quite good by Anthropic. It's made by people that used to work for OpenAI and they left a couple of years ago, started their own company, started doing something. It's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It's better at longer pieces of content. I'm a huge fan of Perplexity AI. Perplexity is a better research tool. So with ChatGPT, we'll give you information. You say, oh, where'd you get that information? It's like, I'm not going to tell you because it's gotten a bunch of trouble for giving people fake information. So now it never gives you the link. Perplexity is written like a uh, college paper. So it gives you a number and the actual foot link with a link to where the source came from. So you can always see the source article. So perplexity is what I use for research. The, okay. That's the tool I use the most for research. I'm a chat GB plus perplexity guy 99% of the time. For image generation, I mostly use mid journey. It's a much better image generator than um, chat than Dolly three. Dolly three is really good at like obeying the command. So if you say what you just, it's more likely to give you what you describe. Like if you say horse on top of a table, dog below the table, Dolly will do better than that. But if you're looking for um, like an image that looks better than mid journey creates better looking images right now. And they go back and forth, right? They're kind of competing okay. with each other. They use two different algorithms. Those are the main tools. There's also a lot of open source AI tools out there. So this company called Hugging Face is kind of where they're all organized. You can see that there are free open source AI tools. You can install it on your computer. That's just as good as ChatGB 3.5. Last year, around June, these two scientists wrote a paper that said no open source AI will ever beat a paid company's AI. And two weeks later, an open source AI beat ChatGB 3.5. So they had to retract the paper because it's the okay. fastest I've ever seen people publish something will never happen and then it happens. It's a two-week window. Like I can't imagine any way to be more embarrassed. Yeah. So the things happening in open source AI are way beyond what ChatGPT is doing, but it's not useful entering most people. Like they're doing things where you could have an AI that's distributed. So there's a little bit on my computer, a little bit on your computer, a little bit on a hundred computers. So it actually has the strength of hundred computers combined, which is cool, but also scary. Like that's when you start yeah. thinking about Skynet stuff, but they're doing things in open source that aren't happening in the paid world. So I think the future is definitely in the open source world. And the open source world also keeps a check on chat TV's pricing. So right now, if you go, hey, you can get an open source AI, it's confusing to install for free, or you can pay $20 a month. Most people do $20 a month. If I told you, hey, it takes about an hour to figure out how to install the free one, or you can pay $1,000 a month. Suddenly the free one doesn't sound that hard to learn. You're like, you know what, I think I'll learn that, yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah. it actually puts a check on what the paid companies can charge. And that's a very good thing. That is, yeah, absolutely.
Um, so where do you think AI eventually becomes um, the internet today where everybody's using it? And, and what do you think it provides the most help to uh, um, the average person? Yeah, I think we're already, there's this theory called the dead internet theory, which is that most of the content on the internet is written by bots and most of the people reading and replying are bots. I think that's possible we're already there, right? Because so much content and so much interaction and it's the one place you can't really get away with it yet is video. You can, right now you can still tell it's an AI video that won't last forever. Yeah. There are people that fall for AI videos, so it's not like everyone can tell. So yeah. that's the negative future that's the down future that eventually yeah. i think what, if that happens what will happen is the internet will become so much bots talking to each other it's like i have chat you read write a script of another ai make the video another ai uploads the videos then your ai watches the video transcribes it creates notes and then it gives you the notes to read right so it's like why don't we just talk to each other for one minute instead yeah so i think that we're gonna see a shift towards human to human interaction in a positive way and this happened in the wow. music industry so What's happened with musicians is that in the 1800s, you wanted to make money, you performed, right? Before recordings existed, if you wanted to make money, you did shows. Yeah. Now it's the same thing again, right? Most uh, artists make 80 to 90% of their revenue from live performances. Yep. It does mean ticket prices have gone up since the 90s, right? But it used to be you could record an album and make millions and millions and millions of dollars yep. from the album. That's over because yep. of the way we've changed how we, since we've shifted from buying to renting music. You no longer get a million dollars to spend recording your album, right? You don't get to do that stuff. Those days are gone. Instead, and we've seen that, like we've seen artists who've done millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, even broken a billion dollars from a single live tour. So there's real money from live performances. So what have we done? Well, we've shifted to human to human interaction, right? Mm -hmm. We've shifted to something that is better, I think. I think live performance is a better place to make money. So artists at first thought, oh, it's all over for us, right? Yeah. But it turns out now that because we can interact with our favorite musicians better, people are buying more of their favorite musicians' merch than ever before, their T-shirts, their dresses, whatever it is that you like from them, directly from the artist. Yeah. They're going to their concerts. And now, of course, artists are kind of in conflict with venues that are taking percentages of their merch sales and other things. But now the conflict has moved to the in-person arena, right? So yeah. there's a lot to be said for how we react to when the technology crosses a certain bridge, we go, Oh, then I'm just going to have to do it in person. So I yeah. think that we're going to actually, it's the same thing that's happening with dating where everyone's like, Oh, I hate the dating apps. And it's like, yeah, that's why people who are smart just stop using them and go, I'm just going person to person. Cause that's where the better action happens anyways. Yep. So technology at a certain point replaces something, but then it gets so prevalent that we go, I'm just going to eject from this. Like, and I'm not going to communicate with people this way. Yep. Like I'm, Think about how long it would take for you and me to get to know each other if we were just texting or just messing each other through Facebook, right? It would take yeah. a year yeah. to accomplish what we've accomplished in less than an hour. Yep. That's the biggest difference is that there's a massive value in our humanity. This yeah. is why now people respond more to video content than anything else because we're suspicious. The first, we used to say, oh, was this post written by you or a VA? Now we say, was this written by ChatGPT? So now we have a suspicion that most content is AI generated. And it's legitimate because most content is AI generating. That's why it's not good. So yeah. the people who are themselves, like when I post content, if I post a video that's not perfect, like I'm obsessed with sound in my here, right? I've got the lighting perfect. I got this and that. I'm Because it's daytime, like the light coming in through the window, obviously I wish that wasn't there because I want everything to be perfect. <laughs> but when I shoot a video on my roof and the audio is a little bit wonky because my other microphone's not that great and I'm outside and then you hear a horn honk, honk in the background, I get way more responses to those because people go, oh, that's definitely real because no one would add yep. a horn. I mean, now, now everyone will because I've said that. <laughs> but the humanity is what increases the value. I And, and I agree. And that's So... My nonprofit is uh, I use media helping veterans with therapy, right? So we have a podcasting project. We have a radio station project for musicians, and we got another project for authors. And it's all about keeping veterans talking. Um, that's the therapy, right? Until you find something that works for you, uh, a 501c uh, support group, something, right? And uh, I, I, exactly what you were saying was the reason why I created the radio station was because I seen veterans that were struggling with algorithms and everything else from Spotify. They were getting buried. And the only way they make money is if they're on a stage, the selling CDs and, and they don't make nothing from Spotify. And, and even with my licensing, I feel bad because 
you know, 18,000 songs that I played cost me overall $3.40 is what my part was, you know. But the good part from this was the radio station has created that human interaction with person A needing a musician now like person B, and I can unite them. And next thing you know, a guy's getting paid to play live. And so that's that's where that's what we did. And and so I absolutely agree with you that the the human interaction at some point we come back. I didn't think about AI bringing that back being the reason, but I do see exactly your point of of how it is bringing people back to that. Because the internet, if it wasn't for podcasting, I wouldn't be on the internet really. So if you think about. Like this was really prevalent 20 years ago. You'd be on Facebook, uh, sorry, AOL, and you'd get a message from someone mm-hmm. back when anyone could message anyone. And after a few questions, you'd realize you're talking to a bot. Yeah. Doesn't feel very good, right? So you, they don't use those as much as they used to. They Now they have a person who pretends to be a bot and stuff like that when they're trying to trick you. And it's like, oh, I'm a beautiful woman who saw your profile and wanted to message you out of the blue. I'm like, yeah, people women don't do that. Like, let's, I know what I look like. Let's calm down here. But Yep. It's a class one that's been around for 20 or 30 years or a prince from Nigeria, whatever. But yeah, the real the thing that happens is we don't want to be tricked. There'd be right. nothing worse than if you're talking to someone and you realize you're being catfished or you're talking to a chat GPT bot. Yep. And the only way to know for sure you're not is to be talking in person and you can touch my face with your finger and go, oh, this is a human. Yep. So the value of human to human as fake interactions become trickier to determine. Because eventually yeah. they'll be able to do video that's just as good, right? The yeah. ability to do AI video is not that far away. It could be six months away. It could be a year away. It could be a couple of years. Eventually, they'll be able to create AI content, which means at first it will be really cool. But eventually, people will go, you know what? I'm only doing face-to-face. Yeah. Uh, you do a deal with me. You meet me face-to-face. And I touch your skin and I smell you so I know you're a real person. So we're actually going to yeah. shift in that direction. So... I think that that's kind of how the shift will go back and forth because like the internet has not turned into what people thought it was going to remember when everyone, like when I was on the internet in the 1990s, the internet was a place where everything was good. Everyone said nice things to each other. Everyone complimented each other. People forwarded jokes to each other. It wasn't a place that it's become now where everyone, everyone wants to share their political opinion. Everyone wants to dox each other. Everyone kind of, mm, there's so much maliciousness on there. There's not the supportive environment that we all thought there was going to be. There are some places where that exists, but so much of it has become, instead of our, our, the best of us, it's become the worst of us. And it means that people pull back. Like my job is the internet, right? My job is the internet. I would never be online. If I, if it wasn't my job, I would never, I would never log into Facebook. I would never go on Instagram. I would never go on LinkedIn if it wasn't my job. And I just, I wouldn't use the internet wholesale if it wasn't my job. I would never be online. I would just be reading books and sitting on the beach and talking to people in real life. Yeah. So for me, as someone who uses it all the time, it's my job. And maybe because it's my job, right? It's like, oh, I don't want to work when I'm not at work. So it's important to see that the real world still exists and that there are good things out there. But anything gets overuse, gets misused, and you get away with it for a while. Just like there's a ton of companies this year that have gone public and done these Mm -hmm. major money raises by adding the word AI to the name of the company. And then people realize they don't do anything with AI and the company loses 90% of its value and the founders get away with a bunch of money or they go to jail. They get, you know, depends on how the SEC decides to deal with it. But that's not going to work forever, right? So there's always going to be people who take advantage. There's tons of AI tools right now that aren't AI. I've caught some tools that are not using AI and they're selling themselves AI and I put out content saying these guys are faking it right? This company is committing a major FTC violation. And the punishment, if they choose you for doing a violation is so it's per person who sees, so if you put out a commercial with a lie in it, you don't get fined based on the commercial. You get fined based on how many people saw the commercial. Right. Okay. And so if you have a video on YouTube with a lie in it, and it can be at least last time I checked up to 40,000 per person. So if you have a million views, you suddenly, uh Oh, for like $4 billion. It could be yeah. a $4 billion fine. So FTC fines can be, they can destroy even the biggest of companies. Yeah. So there's going to be, once they start going after people, there's going to be a shift in the market away from these lies. Cause a lot of companies release an AI and it's just a reskin of chat GPT for more money with less features. 99% of the AI tools out there are chat GPT with less features for more money. 
So when people, I was just writing about this this week on LinkedIn. I said, listen, if you're talking to a company that's trying to sell you an enterprise level AI tool, the odds that they're ripping you off is close to, it's approaching a hundred percent. It's wow. very likely the odds of it, not them, not ripping you off are so low that they're mathematically un undetectable. <laughs> like with the mathematical metal detector, I can't find it because they're all either, because there's only about four AIs that actually exist. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's Llama, which is an open source AI that was put out by Facebook and it's open source and people build the open source AIs on top of it. Now there's variations that are broken free, but that's where that started. There's the one from Google. There's the one for Anthropic. There's one from OpenAI and there's one from Twitter. That's it. So wow. if a company says, oh, we're going to give you a custom AI solution, there are 100% using one of those other sources in the back end. They're using the API. And the cost of using the API is so low that whatever they're charging you, it's 99. Because I have it too. I have an AI tool and it's my, what I built into the tool is the value because it does a task very well, but it's built on ChatGPT's API. I just tell everyone, I just don't keep it a secret like everyone else does. My cost for maintaining the tool is like a dollar a month or something. So I don't have to think oh, about wow. it. Yeah. The cost of maintaining for usage is more than a single person pays in their subscription fee. So it's really important to know that right now there's a lot of people that are massively taking advantage of the hype. They're taking advantage of people that don't understand AI. Right. Most of the content I see, most of the people I compete with, the content they put out is designed to make AI seem really hard and really expensive. And I mean, if you're hog wild, like I am, your AI bill for all of your tools combined should be under a hundred dollars a month. If you're paying more than a hundred dollars a month, you're getting ripped off. You just are. Wow. Because I, for that price, I use like six tools. I have two, and I have two chat GBT subscriptions. Okay. Chat GBT is $40 a month. Cause I have two of them just because I have one that I use and one my team uses. And I use one for building bots and one for my daily use. So I kind of separate those two things. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason I have two. It's a specific use case specifically because I do a lot inside of AI and I want to run two projects at the same time. I have a mid journey subscription, $12 a month. I have another AI image generator subscription with Leonardo. Again, because I have multiple people that work for me, I just needed a second image generator that other people could use at the same time. I think that's another $12 a month. And then there's some other tools I play around with. I'm testing a tool. I'll be testing a tool for a couple of months so that I pay a little subscription for that. But most of the time, even the, the tools I'm testing, eventually I close down. I think I have... And I have a video editor that's $15 a month. That's ACES. It does really good at what it does with AI. And then I think I have one other tool, you know, some other, so just, it's like if a power user like me who does it full time and could not be further into the AI world is spending a hundred dollars a month. If you're spending thousands, you have a major problem in your business. Yeah. Either the person in your team who's in charge of making AI purchases is stealing from you or the person that they've purchased from is stealing from you. Just so it's a guarantee because of what these tools cost. Right. And just like you said, with the way open source is is keeping a, a watch over the market and, and capping it, that, that's another reason why, yeah. I mean, if you didn't know that, I, sure, you, you're going to pay a lot more. But if you knew that ahead of time, I, I could see how you know easy you could see it. But the average guy not understand that he's paying way too much. Well, fortunately, right now, most of the dishonesty is in the B2B space. So at the enterprise level, so I recently was approached by a large B2B company to work on a project for them. Now mm -hmm. they didn't sign the contract. They didn't send me the NDA. So I can say whatever I want. They should have, they definitely should have, if they wanted me not to say anything, they were, they charge hundreds of thousands of dollars for their really high level AI knowledge. And they gave me what they teach people, their most highest level stuff. And I don't think this is exactly what's in my book. That you can get for free. If you have a Kindle limited subscription, <laughs> like, they're charging companies. I was like, Oh my gosh, you could just say enterprise. They were, he gave me the, he goes, this is my secret slide deck for presentation. I went through the slide deck. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I put this video on YouTube like four months ago. <laughs> like, wow. At the highest level, people who are selling services, it's just the way they describe it. There's no yeah. difference other than they describe what they do with much fancier speak words. And all these big companies do is sell each other services and consulting that is exactly what you can get. I mean, my book is literally free you can download it for free on linkedin if you follow me on linkedin or you can get it for free and if you want to pay for it it's like eight dollars yeah. it has all of the stuff that this guy is charging hundreds of thousands of dollars for and i was like this is unbelievable i was like so excited to work with someone at the enterprise level I was like oh they must know a bunch of stuff i don't know and 
Yeah. Turns out, no. Turns out there was nothing in there. And I've I've talked to someone who works at OpenAI before. So I was working on something, I was talking to someone at OpenAI, and I was like, hey, I think these are the next four features you're going to release. Can you let me know if I'm right? And the guy, his mouth just keeps getting open wider and wider. He goes, I can neither confirm nor deny, but a uh, pretty good list. And I was like, <laughs> whoa. I was like, and then all those features were released in the next couple of weeks. So I, I was right, but it was cool to get the confirmation. So yeah. this belief that companies with more money, larger budgets are smarter than us, it's not true. So yeah. the need to spend, because sometimes, and this has happened before, like when I was selling search engine optimization services in 2010, I approached a really large hotel and I said, listen, the company you've hired is stealing from you. What I said, when someone visits your website, and this is a very expensive website, and the website redirects to Motel 6. I said, whoever you hired to do your SEO has, is stealing from you. And my mistake was I didn't realize the person I sent in my report of all the things that were wrong with their website was the person who paid, the person who was stealing from them. So they went into CYA mode. They wrote me a very offensive email. I wish I'd saved it. I should have saved it as a great memory. They wrote me a really messed up email. And then they redid everything from my list. They fixed all the things on the next one. They go, oh, <laughs> what person who's stealing from you? Because they go, if I admit that I hired a company that doesn't know what they're doing, then I could lose my job. So what you're yeah. going to see is same thing that happened with website design in the 2000s, SEO in the 2010s, social media in the 2015s. You're going to see all of these people who pay for AI do a terrible job. And then they go, oh, I have to lie to my boss about my mistake or I could lose my job. So I've seen it happen multiple times. This is why I don't really like to work at the corporate level because as soon as somebody's best interest is themselves, not the, not themselves, not the client who I'm actually working for, then you have a conflict of interest. So whenever someone else is like, oh, I can either do what's best for the company, or I can do what's best to keep my job. And I'm sure you saw this in the military. I have a feeling that this occurs in the military as well, that sometimes people go, well, this is how I get a promotion versus this is the best thing that's the thing that's best for my team or the best thing that's good for the US Absolutely. military. Yeah. So it ha as soon as you get an organization above seven people, like as soon as you have to have a manager inside the team, you're going to start to get this. Yep. And this is why at the enterprise level, fortunately for us, right? People that are smaller businesses. So it's not worth these companies' times to steal from us when they can just steal from enterprise level customers, right? I've seen companies spend, like I saw a company, they spent like $100 million on this uh, initiative, right? Mm -hmm. To add something. Like, and then a month later, they had to fire a number of employees that was worth that much in salary <laughs> because they had redirected it towards something dumb. So anytime yeah. companies make these big decisions, right? Like in London, the police force has shifted to, they've arrested a lot of people for comments on Facebook, but they've also stopped investigating home invasions. So they completely said, if someone does a home invasion, we're not even going to send the police to your house to investigate. We're not doing crime scene. We're not investigating that. So they've shifted. What do you think has happened to home invasions? Obviously, they've gone up, but yeah. they, right? It's no longer a crime. And so whenever you make a decision like that, um, that happens at the corporate level, what happens is the person who decided to arrest people for like hurting people's feelings on Facebook, that now they can't admit, well, real crime is up way yeah, because then they could lose their job. So they're now invested in whatever decision they made, even though it's for most of us, we go, I would much rather you really hurt my feelings online than kick in the front door of my house and rob me. Like if I could choose, I will always choose the online hurt my feelings. Yeah. But that's just the way it is, is that at these larger organizations, they put people in charge. And right now the people in charge of like acquisitions and IT, they're dummies. I talk to them all the time. What you have is a lot of people who've changed in. The biggest change in LinkedIn profiles is people switch from programmers to AI engineers. They change what their expertise is. They're just by writing a new description. And the last thing you want to solve an AI problem is a programmer because a programmer is a hammer. They say, oh, the solution to every problem is writing custom code. The biggest mistake you can make right now financially as a company is to write custom code built upon AI. So let's say you write a custom code based on ChatGPT's API. By the time mm -hmm. you're finished, ChatGPT's changed what their API does, which means your custom code doesn't work, which means we have to start the project over again. So we now have an, the snake eating its own tail. Yeah. By the time we finish the project, the project's not relevant. Like I've seen a bunch of uni universities do this too. A bunch of universities are now offering degrees in AI. I guarantee you in four years, when you graduate, at least seven out of the eight semesters of content will be worth absolutely nothing. If someone I, comes to me and says, yeah. I have four years of AI experience. Oh, you have experience in AI from 2018. Well, that's worth zero. You have AI experience in 2019. That's also worth zero. 
only yeah. experience in the last 12 months is worth anything. Yeah. So all of this mindset and universities are trying to stay relevant, which they're not like, there's no way I would send my kids to a university. I can't think of a better way to waste your money. It right? takes too you long know? to change curriculum. They'd never be able to keep up. <laughs> yeah. I, if, have you ever met someone with a degree in social media? There's a guarantee. Yeah. I, I've met a bunch of people with degrees in social media and their knowledge of social media is so rudimentary. Like they, the most they know is they know, oh, I know the difference between Twitter and Facebook. Like that's the extent of their knowledge. I'm like, wow, you spent a quarter of a million dollars in four years to learn that Facebook and Twitter are a little bit different. <laughs> and they don't know anything about how to grow, what type of content works, how to go viral, because it's never been all in on them. Same yeah. thing with people that do social media for large corporations. They're morons. They just are. I've never met somebody who did social media for a large company who was anything less than a full bird moron because they have no consequences. Yeah. If I do social media for myself, okay, I did something last night. I did a cross promotion with someone else. You know what I'm checking is how many email addresses came in, how many people submitted their email address. I'm measuring an actual metric. Most yeah. large companies don't pay attention to anything. They don't care. They just want to know yeah. content's going out there. They're not paying attention to the result, which means you're not in results driven, which means you don't have to get good at results. So when yeah. you're working for government, when you're working for a large company, because results aren't a part of it, it's more of like, did you put out a lot of content? Yes, we did a tweet yesterday. Okay, that's fine. They don't look at, did anyone, like no one is reposting McDonald's tweets. No, no. one is reposting or paying, liking these big companies' tweets because they're putting out content that stinks. Yep. And they don't know it because they think, oh, they're trying to do brand awareness, which is the worst form of marketing. It's the same thing as like brand education. Like whenever someone is looking for an investment, right? And they go, oh, First, we have to educate the market that the problem exists. Then we have to sell them the solution. I go, oh, no, I don't want to be part of that. Because that's the most expensive thing you can do, right? Education yeah. is so expensive. And someone comes in who doesn't have to pay for that, all that education, they can steal your market share because their costs are way lower. Yep. I'm, I'm dealing with that right now because we're so far behind the technology. And now we've got to pay to educate some people. And it's a it's a hard pill for some for people above you to swallow because they see the dollar signs. Yeah, and it's large companies the way they do business is they allocate a budget to something and then especially the once you get really large they don't really pay attention to it. Like what happens in government is if they give you a budget of 10 million dollars you spend 9 million. Well next year they're going to give you a budget of 9 million. Yep. They punish you for efficiency, which means they reward you for inefficiency. That's why at the end of the year, you'll always see all these um, government departments suddenly go on a spending spree because they don't want to lose their budget for next year. Did it for 20 years. And, in oh, the world. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's why you end it. You go, oh, we need three helicopters. They go, oh, we got you a submarine, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like military acquisitions or it's like they did a big change with the uniforms, right? They changed yeah. the whole uniforms. No one checked to see if this new uniform makes you more invisible. And it was the opposite, right? The digital yeah. camo, they, they spent so much money on that because the Marines did a massive study and then to figure out what the pattern had to be. And then the army goes, we want that too. And they just made it and didn't check and it made them more visible, not less, which is yep. not what you want from camouflage. Like I'm not an yeah. expert in military stuff, but I know that. Yeah. I know you definitely want to be more invisible, not less. And so they had to switch back because someone- in the desert. Yeah, someone gets a visit from the good idea fairy. Like I knew guys- who in the 1990s, they went to the first Gulf War and all their uniforms were the wrong color because they were the color of the beach near them, not the color of the desert because the desert's different color. Yep. Not all sand the same color. And right. somebody like somebody should have definitely thought of that, right? And that's what happens is that higher ups, when they make a mistake, they don't want to admit. No one wants to admit they're the one who didn't think, right? They're the one yep. who should have figured out what color should their uniforms be, what color should their weapons be. What's the sand situation, right? Because fighting in sand is different than fighting in grass. Yep. It's the same thing that happened in the Vietnam War. They gave soldiers a bunch of guns. Or in the Korean War, they gave soldiers guns that the bullets wouldn't go through the enemy's uniform. That's a pretty big mistake, right? Yeah. So it has always been happening. Yeah. So any you have large organizations, you leave the door open to larger mistakes. Like the idea that large companies don't make mistakes is always astounding to me because like no the larger organization they should get to make mistakes with a larger scale yeah oh yeah you're absolutely right um so i want to hit one last topic before we end let's get into your books um so how long have you been writing so i've been writing professionally since around 2009 2010 so i did my graduate work 
got my master's in applied linguistics in 2009 and my dissertation was published in Europe. I was like, someone reached out and said, Hey, can we publish your dissertation? I said, sure. That's it. And that made me think, Oh, people will pay for my writing. Yeah. And from then I just began writing books. I go, Oh, I saw it as once I realized that it was a possibility, I started writing books and publishing them in different places. So I've been publishing books now for, I guess it's 14 years. Oh, well, that's awesome. And you're 300, was it 300 books that you've, you wrote? Yeah. So I've written a lot of books under my own name. I think I've got about 50 books under my own name and a lot of them are for clients. So it's either ghostwriting projects or pen name projects. And I still write, like I don't write anymore, but I still write six books a year. So it's like my version of don't write anymore is not everyone else's. So right. now I do more, now I do more of like coaching people or helping people to write their book. I don't do the whole project for them as often. Mm -hmm. But I still do it some. Oh, that that is awesome, man! You know, and and that's the the third project from our nonprofit is is it's called uh, Words from a Warrior, and it's it's for bloggers and authors. And I'm I'm currently writing that project out. It hasn't really the website's up, but it's not anything yet. And so, you know, that's that's one of the things I've been talking to a lot of different authors and and getting different ideas because I'm I'm not. I've wrote uh, one book about my situations with PTSD and my audience is my kids. And that's, you know, I haven't published it. I haven't done anything, but it was my way to explain the changes that happened in me and the things that they seen where they didn't understand what I went through, you know? And so I gave them that much. I at least gave them the answers to the whys and of what their questions were. And, uh, I haven't, you know, my, my kids say I should publish it, but I, I haven't personally decided yet, but, uh, um, it's, it's definitely something I want to find people that are going to be able to willing to help some of these, um, other veterans that have tremendous stories, but they don't understand anything about publishing and, and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons why I've increased my, my guests to authors to just get feedback and ideas so I can help them as, as well. It's a, it's a tricky world as I'm learning, you know? So there's a couple of things you brought up there. So the thing about PTSD is that um, we don't really talk about it enough. Like we especially don't talk about it for men and men's mental health. So uh, I have it as well. So I went through a natural disaster where my entire family got to the hospital with less than 12 hours to live. So, oh. and I didn't know. So when I had to, and I talk about it because if I don't, nobody else will, I had to go into therapy for it afterwards because like when I got to the hospital, they were like, Oh, you'll be dead in a couple hours. And, um, my whole family would have been dead within three days. Like none of us were going to make it. So I have, and it's a thing called natural disaster PTSD. I didn't know it was a thing. I thought PTSD was only military. Yeah. So it turns a lot out. Of people watch, so there's a lack of education. So when I actually got into therapy and the person gave a name for it, I said, Oh, I have a real thing. It yeah. like gave me a comfort to know that. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm just trying to steal what soldiers go through, but I don't know how else to describe it. But I guess seeing your whole family die counts yeah. so that's the thing but it can be very hard to talk about it because so when i talk about what happened to me we were in a natural disaster we were in uh the highest level of typhoon like the equivalent of katrina but in a third world country right and no help yeah. came and uh what you will do to save your family is unbelievable there's nothing i wouldn't do right and yeah. you don't realize that until you face it that there's this thing inside of you so then you have to face the fact that you're not what you thought you were. Like we all like we're I think what is it two we're like two meals away from civilization or three days yep. away from civilization. You only have to starve for one or two days before you find out what you'll do, and it's just about anything. So it can be that, but then it's like, well, the fortunate thing for me is when I tell people about it, no one believes me. So when people ask me about it here in person, they're like, oh, what were you willing to do? I was like, oh, this, this, and this. I was like, we were about to do this, this, and this, and we finally got out. And people just don't believe me because it's too extreme. So it's like an interesting place to be in because what I say is such a shocking answer that yeah. I'm like, oh, I could talk about this all day long because no one believes me, which yeah. is kind of a crazy place to be. Yeah. Um, because less, but people who've been there go, oh, he's not joking. So either you've been there and you've experienced it too, or you haven't and you think I'm joking. So I'm in this interesting place. It took me what, two years to figure that out. Um, but then as far as writing books you know let's talk about that is that yeah the first thing is that the first reason to write a book is to get something inside of you out yep so that's what you did right you have to yep. get it out and you aren't looking to say to the world the second thing is if 
and a lot of people have this. They go, I just want to tell this story. I don't care if anyone reads it. I get those clients all the time. Yep. And that you just have to go and okay, I'll write this book, but no one's ever going to read it. It won't make any money. Now, my feeling is that if you really want to help people, let's let's imagine this. Let's say your book had the cure for PTSD mm -hmm. and you didn't publish it. So you didn't help all the people you could have helped. Well, then that means you're a monster, right? You have the cure for cancer and you're keeping it a secret. So if your book is good, you have a moral obligation to publish it, right? If you think it can really help people. And that's how I view it. So when I work with people, I go, if your book really can do what you says it can do, then you have to get it out there because you can help so many people. So let's just say, and this is a heavy question. Like this is a lot to say to me. Like, let's imagine your book stops one guy from unaliving himself. Isn't it worth it? Like, wouldn't that be worth it? Because I've gotten that email before. Yeah. So I've gotten an email and it was about the wrong book. It was so crazy. It goes, it wasn't my book on depression, but someone read one of my books and goes, your book saved my marriage. Because of your book, I understood my husband and now our marriage is stronger than ever before. That's, that's my favorite email for every email I've ever gotten. Yeah. So um, sometimes we get so caught up in thinking about ourselves, right? It's like, oh, this is just my story. No one will care. Yeah, Matt, what if only one, what if one person reads your book and it saves their life? That's a win. Like, why? I, I sure I have a huge audience, but like I count my wins one at a time. Like, that's yeah. a win for me. So, that's my belief is that if you think your book is good, then you it's not about your pride or confidence. It's about what difference you can make. The second thing is to make a book succeed, it's really just reverse engineering. So if I want to build a helicopter, it's so much easier for me to go and look at a helicopter you've built and look at the parts and then build and copy it, right? Yep. That's how you write a book. You go, what are books that are four of the same people, right? What are books, let's say, about PTSD or about depression or about dealing with trauma that have done well? And you look at them and go, what? how long is the title? Oh, they all have a three-word title. Well, now you know your title should be three words, right? Yep. What color is the cover? Well, nine of them have a blue cover. One of them have a red cover. So what would I tell you? If you hired me, I would say, oh, you should have a blue cover. That's where most of my advice comes from is I'm just a good researcher. Yeah. And then you look at, well, how many chapters should it have? Well, all of these books are 200 pages. Well, then your book should be 200 pages. So it's not the actual content that you reverse engineer, but it's the structure. Then you go, well, how are the chapters structured? Because I've read some books where every chapter is like three pages and some books reach chapters 40 pages. So it's different. How is it structured? right? How do they start the book? How do they end the book? What are the books that people like? And then I read the reviews. I read the, I only read five star and one star reviews. What do people love about my competitor's book? And what do they wish that book had that it's missing? When you have that information, now what you have is the skeleton, right? You have all the skeleton. My kids always say skeleton. That's why I say that. <laughs> you have the skeleton of a great book because you go, oh, I know how long the book needs to be. I know how the chapter should be structured. I know how it should be organized. I know all of the pieces. And that's where you all the hard stuff is done for you okay so that's the hard part of writing can be done by reverse engineering and you can look at every book on amazon every book on amazon is ranked so you know how many reviews it has you know how many people have bought it recently based on its sales ranking so you don't have to guess yeah. where to get your data source so that's what i would do and for whatever you're trying to do that's the approach I always take, whether I'm creating a product or doing a podcast, whatever I do, I look at what other people are doing. Cause I just like recently I've been really doing a lot of work on LinkedIn. I just look at what everyone else does about AI and LinkedIn and wrote down a list of what I like and what I don't like. And that's how I make my content. I go, this is what's good. This is what's bad. Okay. I mean, that makes, that makes perfect sense, you know? And, and for me, I guess my, my hesitation is, is, you know, I think of some of the, some of the content I got in there involves um, other people's families. And, uh, you know, I think about the, the band aid that gets ripped off if they were to be the people that read it, you know? Okay. That's something different. That's a great thing to bring up, which is that I never use people's real names. I never use ways right. to actually describe people. Um, so that if you're talking about specific things, then I would pull all of that part out because okay. the last thing you want to do is that yeah so you last the last thing i want someone to do is read a book and realize i'm talking about them because right. it happened with a blog post once and it was like uh oh don't do that again like people don't like people do not want to be in your book or in your blog post without permission even if you anonymize but they can figure out it's them because you didn't change enough facts so that's something different is that 
I always tell people like, do not use anyone's real name. Do not make it so they can identify themselves. It's, it doesn't make the book better. You can change the details enough that whether, cause even if people give you permission, they might change their mind later. Yeah. Better just avoid that. No, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Hey, Jonathan, I appreciate you coming on, man. Why don't you take a second, tell everybody a good place that they can find you. I know I've had your, your link going through the bottom, but where, where else can they find you? Everything about me is at serve no master. You can Google serve no master. Every single result is me. The first hundred it's either my podcast links to my podcast or links to my books or links to my blog. And it's, it's my name on every social media platform. Serve no master. Easy to find. Absolutely, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I, I know I have learned a ton. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't wait till we're done. And I'm going to, I'm going to go try some of this stuff because man, it's like you opened up a whole new chat world to me. So I'm definitely going to go take a look at it. And I know a lot of my, my uh, listeners are going to be the same way because a lot of them are interested in this and have very limited knowledge as well. So I appreciate it. I hope you take care. Have a good day. Thank you so much.